Man, I'm glad that you are here. Uh, first week of the, the new year, uh, 2024. Uh, is anybody counting down until 2025 yet? Is it for you, the, for the first week, you're just like, <laughs> turn the page. Um, I saw a meme the other day. And it, was, it, was, it was kind of, it was that, that whole deal where, like, man, even the first week of the year has been tough. And, and here's the thing. Uh, Liz said it beautifully, and I hope you, you know that and you sense that uh, about our church, is I know that on a given Sunday, we have people walking in here, you just got your dream job, you, um, things are great, things are here, and we want to be the kind of church that celebrates with you. Man, we want to high five, and we want to we have a party, like, let's have a party. Uh, but we also know that you might be walking in here, and, and you may be going through a real difficult season, and uh, we also want you to know, hey, we're here with you. We're going we're gonna to weep with those who mourn, we're going to celebrate and with joy-filled hearts with those that are celebrating. And so we're, we're here with you. And so, listen, we, we believe that God has a, a word for us this, this year. And so we, we are prayerful. We're prayerful as we start out the year. Uh, we're prayerful as we lay out uh, just all of the sermons. Um, we've got our entire year sort of laid out, our preaching calendar. We, we, know, we know where we're going in the Word of God uh, for really the, the entire year. And uh, the beginning of the year for me, like how you start out is important. And so I really take some time and uh, really talk with our team and just get a sense of like, hey, this is what I feel I mean, like what the Lord is saying and what I feel like our, our, our church is going to be a foundational word for the year. It's going to be a word that I, I invite you to grab hold of, write it down somewhere, um, pray, pray it in your life, um, stand on it, if you will. But it, it is a, a word that I've been sitting with now for uh, a number of months, just a number of months, just really praying it kind of in our church. And uh, so today I want to I want to offer it, and, and over this month we're gonna we're gonna continue to offer it. It is the theme of uh, really this first this first series, and, and I want us to to be open. I want the I want the Lord to, to speak to our hearts. And so I really have been I've been praying for you. I uh, pray that uh, this Sunday uh, that it would be one that resonates with you, uh, and if not, uh, we're gonna we're gonna ring the bell again next week, and the week after, and the week after. And we really believe that it's gonna gonna get root uh, in in us. Um, you ready for God's word? All right, if you got your Bibles, go to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. If you have your own Bibles, I'm going to give you a couple moments just to get to Habakkuk, because some of you, you've never even seen that book in the Bible. You even know, you even know it's in your Bible. It's in the Old Testament. If you get to the New Testament, no judgment, but take a left. Um, get back to the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read it from uh, the message uh, translation. Uh, I'd love some of the language there. Uh, and then I'll also offer it to you um, from the ESV just so that you can hear uh, some of the nuance, so that you can hear some of the language. Uh, but Habakkuk uh, chapter 3, and we're going to read uh, two verses there. It's on the screen for you here in the, in the message translation first. It says, God, I have heard what our ancestors say about you, and I'm stopped in my tracks, down on my knees. Do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you worked among them. And as you bring your judgment, as surely you must, remember mercy. Well, church, let's read it again. God, I've heard what our ancestors say about you, and I'm stopped in my tracks, down on my knees. Do among us what you did among them, and work among us as you worked among them. And as you bring your judgment, as surely you must, remember mercy. Let's hear how it is written in the, the ESV, just to hear the, a little bit of a change. It says, O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. And O oh Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. And in wrath, remember mercy. Let's bow our heads and our hearts for prayer. Father, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So God, I I pray in the next few moments, Lord, your word would come alive in us. The Holy Spirit that that brings this word into existence would also be the same Holy Spirit that opens our ears and opens our heart, makes us tender so that we might receive it. That our heart would be the soil that receives the, the seed of the word. And it's not choked out by life and circumstance, that the enemy doesn't rob us of the word, but that the word of the Lord would be planted into our hearts, that it would take root, 
and it would produce a harvest. Let our lives produce the harvest that you desire, Lord. Not even what we've dreamed. May we live a life that is in rhythm with the dream of God. And Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. We give you all the praise now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. When you think about many of the prophetic books in the Old Testament, oftentimes the prophetic book is, is postured in, in such a way where it is the word of the Lord that is given to, to the oracle of God, given to the prophet, and the prophet then delivers the word to, to God's people. Habakkuk is, a, is an interesting book. It's, it's three chapters. You know I love to assign you homework. So on the first Sunday of the year, we're going to assign you a little bit of homework. And the homework is this. Read the three chapters of, of Habakkuk. You, you could read it uh, over a cup of coffee. You could read it uh, quickly. But, but read it. And here's where you'll get the sense. H- Habakkuk is not the type of prophet who is only interested in declaring the word of the Lord to the people. But he is the type of prophet that brings the heart of the people to God. Habakkuk's book in writing, is a, it is a prayer. It's a prayer. And here's what's happening in his prayer. His prayer, he's struggling with some realities that are happening around him. Let's just be honest in church. There are many times that we've postured ourselves and we've come, we've come to the Lord in prayer and we have been weary. We've been burdened. We've been worried about things. Even many of us now, when, when we look at the landscape just in our, in our culture, we see things sort of happening around the globe. We see things transpiring even in our, in our, own, in our own country, maybe in our neighborhoods and in our homes. We, we see that there is just some unrest. We see there's a sense of, of fear. There's a sense of worry. There's a sense of, of doubt. We just are unsure of God. How are you working all things together for good for those that believe when it seems the opposite of that is true? I know I'm not the only person that opens their eyes and sees things. And you, you go, God, what, what are you doing? Scandal and tragedy and all of these things happening. And you say, God, how, how in the world are you working in and amongst this? Habakkuk comes to the Lord. And at a time when God is using a, a pagan nation to deliver his judgment and to work his will amongst the people of God, Habakkuk feels just like that. God, how are you doing this how are you working in our lives when we can't seem to sense it? And so then he gets to this place, and, and his heart is just postured before the Lord. And he says, listen, I, I've heard the stories. Stories have the ability to become either the truth that we accept, or it can become the way in which we posture in life. Think about the way in which you tell stories. Are you always the hero? Do you ever tell the stories of the times of when maybe you weren't as successful? Or for you, do you have a few of those stories that are always sort of go-to whenever you're at the party, whenever you're at the meeting, and you share these stories, and they always bring you in a good light? Many of these stories, if we're not careful, that we tell about ourselves are less true, and they actually become more mythology. You ever have a person that tells you about fishing expeditions? I caught a fish, and it was... The fish seems to grow each time they tell the story. You ever have a person tell you about, a, about an adventure? Listen to me. You hear me talk about golf too long, and I'm like, man, you think that I could be on the tour the way in which I talk about golf when the reality is I'm good at finding golf balls in the woods. Can I get an amen to that? If we're not careful, the way in which we tell stories shapes the way in which we think, shapes the way in which we believe, shapes the way in which we live our lives. Some of the stories, not just that we tell, but the stories that we even accept and receive. Many of us have grew up with stories framing our family in a certain light, and we came to believe that that was all that could be or would be. Sometimes stories become very, very dangerous for us to hold and even pass on. But sometimes we tell the stories to ourselves and the stories that can get us excited. It riles us up. It postures us towards a place of, of victory. I am a sports fanatic, if you will. I love it. I love all types of sports. I, I love football. I love college football. I love baseball. I love watching basketball. I love watching golf. I'll even watch live golf if it's on. You know what I mean? Like I'll watch whatever. I'm, I'm a sports guy. I, I have some teams that I follow with an incredible passion, but a lot of times I just love the storylines amongst the teams that are playing. I just enjoy watching it. 
I know many of you are the same way. I grew up in, I think, the golden era of, of the NBA, if I'm honest. I, I think my time that I was sort of coming up, it's the golden area of the NBA. And I know to the to younger folks in the room, I sound like the old guy that says this, that back in my day, it was such and such. I get it. I'm becoming that dude. But man, 90s basketball was something. I, I grew up in Orlando and I was a Magic fan, still kind of a Magic fan, even though I'm not there. But man, I was there in the height of the Orlando Magic. Shaquille O'Neal was drafted from LSU. And I remember when we got the first pick, Man, the fact that we were getting Shaquille O'Neal was a big thing. We celebrated. We were excited. A couple years later, we get Penny Hardaway. And man, the magic are on the come up. I'm excited. It was a fun time. I had a friend who had season tickets. I got to go to more magic games that I could count. Man, we were getting those. One of my favorite parts about going to a magic game was getting the Pizza Hut personal pan pizza. You felt grown carrying that pizza box, friends. Supreme paid the extra because his parents were paying, you know, you know how it is. But I remember going to these magic games and just having the time of our life. And Shaquille O'Neal was larger than life. I remember when he went to the Lakers, the devastation that I felt as a teenager that he was leaving our home team. If you've ever seen Shaquille O'Neal, though, he is a mountain of a human. God took more time building him than God took building me. Let me just tell you that. That brother's built different. Caden and I, he was about six or seven years old, and we were walking in Orlando. We were in the Millennium Mall. And I looked up, and I was like, that's Shaq. And Caden's like, who's that? And I was like, come here. So I walk up, and I was like, uh, Mr. O'Neill. And I kind of introduced myself real quick. And I, I used, and you guys do this, I, had a, I knew I had a person that worked with him. A friend of mine worked with him. So I immediately used that relationship to build connections so that we can have a conversation, right? And then I leverage my son. I'm not above that. So we stop, we're talking for a few moments, and uh, he, he's like, hey, can, can, want me to take a picture with your son? I go, I absolutely want to take a picture with my son. I regret now that I didn't get the picture because Caden didn't even know who the guy was. I was the fan. <laughs> my son, though, gets in the, in the room. But say, Nevertheless, he, he gets in and he takes the picture. Caden comes to, like, his kneecap. Like, it just, Shaq's, like, taking a, like putting his arm down here, and he's, like, reaching all the way down, massive hand on Caden's head, you know. And Caden's like, Dad, was that a giant? <laughs> I was like, yes, son, that was. That was a giant. That was a giant. One of the stories that I love about Shaquille O'Neal was this, was this story that he sort of let, kind of, he perpetuated this story. He's a young kid, grew up in the San Antonio area. And David Robinson was the sort of star center of the San Antonio Spurs for a number of years. Incredible reputation. Great in the community seemingly great family man, just David Robinson was kind of like first class. He was, he was called the Admiral. He was part of the U.S. Navy, and then he went to the NBA. And Shaq let this story get out about David Robinson, because there was a lot of questions as they were going up, and as they were like facing one another, it was like, is, is this rookie, is, is Shaq going to be able to like hold a candle to, to David Robinson? And he lets this story out about a time when he was young, going to a San Antonio Spurs game, and he asked David Robinson for an autograph, and David Robinson rebuffed him as a kid and basically said, no, get out of here, kid, I'm not giving you an autograph. And that becomes this motivation for Shaq to whenever they would go up against one another, that now he is operating with a sense of like fury and vengeance. Then after Shaq retires, do you know what he tells? He says it was a lie. It wasn't true. Never asked David Robinson for an autograph as a kid. David Robinson never turned him down as a kid. It was just a story he was telling himself because he knew that the story would also light a fire in him and he would be able to go. He needed to create a story that allowed him to do the things that he needed to do. In the midst of COVID, there was a, a beautiful gift that was given to all of us. I don't know if you've opened the gift, but many of us in the room have. And it was a 10-part documentary series. And the 10-part documentary series was called The Last Dance. Any of God's people seen The Last Dance? Okay, some of you. The rest of you, what, what the world's wrong with you? What are you doing with your lives? You got 10 hours to spare, right? You may want to watch this. But it was chronicling the sort of last season of the, the, the Chicago Bull dynasty in the, the 1990s. 
And one of the things that happens over and over is they're recounting all of these sort of matchups throughout uh, Jordan's career and all the ways in which he, he had to kind of battle and through the Pistons and through all these different areas. There was this common phrase that was said over and over by Michael Jordan. It's become a meme now. Many people use it in different places. But he would, he would tell a story and then he would say this, and I took it personally. He said, and I took it personally. And what that meant was it was a story that became this sort of fuel to move them in such a way as that they, he would be able to, to overcome and conquer. He was fueled by a sense of anger, by a sense of frustration, by a sense of needing to have something be a villain for him to overcome. There are others, though, and we see this even now in the generation of the NBA that is emerging now, where, where there are some that play not because they are sort of mad at the world and have to go scorch to earth, but they play with such joy. Have you ever seen Stephen Curry play? He plays with joy, smiling, having a blast. Like he's just making people look foolish and he's loving every part of it. The question that I have for you today is what stories are you retelling? What stories are you accepting? What stories are the motivation in your heart? You see Habakkuk, when he comes to to God and he's in God's presence and he says to the Lord, there's all these things sort of happening. I don't, I don't know what's going on. He reminds himself and he recenters himself on a story and through the narrative of scripture. You see the people of Israel throughout, throughout the old Testament, you see this happening over and over again. They always point back to the Exodus. If you got time today, read Psalm 77. Psalm 77 pairs very, very well with Habakkuk's prayer. Because what it does is it talks about a time of, of, of frustration. It talks about a place of weariness. And then you go to a place where it reminds them of what God has done and what was fueling them, what was pulling the psalmist out of a place of despair. What was motivating Habakkuk is the stories that they heard about the faithfulness of God. And so friend, here's the question that I just simply want to ask you. What stories are you telling yourself to draw yourself nearer to the presence of God? What stories are you reminding yourselves about God's faithfulness, about God's steadfastness? Because see, here's the beautiful thing. You and I should be rehearsing the saving deeds of God. You and I should be retelling these stories to to one another. So listen to me. This morning, here's the, the way in which we practice this out. We prayed for two people in the congregation, maybe a couple more. If God moves in their life and God touches them and God heals them, listen to me, if they keep that to themselves and quiet and don't share with us, hey, the Lord really sort of worked this out and I started, if they don't share that to us, do you see what sort of happens amongst the people of God? We don't have the ability to give God praise. We don't have the ability to celebrate. We don't have the ability as a collective whole to go, man, look at what God's doing amongst us. Many of us, what we've done is we've fallen victim to the lie that our spirituality is privatized, that it's just for us, or maybe it's for my family, or or maybe it's just for this segment. But no, no, listen, the beautiful thing about a, a church family, about the people of God, is that we're coming collectively to share and retell the saving deeds of God. We're coming to stand with you as you are in a season of great victory. We're here to stand alongside you as you are sort of seeking what is God doing in your midst. And friend, listen to me. If you hold on to the story and you don't pass the story on and retell the story, you choke out, you choke out the message of God that needs to be handed and passed on generation after generation. This is what is powerful about the people of God in the Old Testament. They had the ability, they were committed to, regardless of their situation, retelling the saving deeds of God. When it seemed like there was no hope, they reminded themselves how God had delivered them. And listen to the language that we read today. Do among us what you did among them. And so for us, the word, the phrase that we're gathering around in the beginning of this year is this phrase, once again. And what I'm saying to us as a church is to come to the Lord with this posture. God, once again, do among us what you've heard, what we've heard you have done among them. The ways in which you've worked miracles, the ways in which you have been steadfast and the ways in which you have been faithful, the ways in which you have kept your covenant with us when we have broken our end of the deal. Is there anybody here that's grateful that God keeps his promises to us not based on our faithfulness, but based on his faithfulness and desire to keep 
his word. God is faithful to us. And so for us, we, we see Habakkuk and he says, do among us what you, what you did among them. He says, I, I want you to work now like you did then. I don't know about you, but I have a, just a deep desire to not just tell the stories of what God has done, but to be part of some stories that God is writing here and now. I don't want to just talk about how God healed. I don't want the stories that I tell about God to just simply be past tense. Are you tracking with me? But I want to live in such a way, and I want to live with, with the people where, where we're writing some stories about God here and now, where God is doing some things in and amongst our midst, and we are, are chronicling it so that we can continue to tell the story of what God's doing. We continue to tell the faithfulness of God. We continue to tell how God shows up when we didn't know how he was going to, in a culture and in a place where it didn't seem like God was flourishing. And we can tell the story of how his steadfast love never fails, it never ceases. His mercy is without end. And then Habakkuk says, listen, as you are working out your justice among us, would you remember mercy? And friends, whenever we see that word mercy in scripture, sometimes it has some a variety of meaning, but the ones I want us to notice that it's talking about here, it's really put on display beautifully in Luke chapter number 18. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn me to Luke chapter 18. As we think about how God remembers mercy, Luke chapter 18, verse 35. As he, Jesus, drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he acquired what this meant, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Luke is kind because in, in other scriptures where it's recounting the same one, it identifies that it was the disciples that were telling him to be quiet. But Luke's kind to them, doesn't put them on blast. He says he's telling them to be so quiet. He said, but he cried out all the more. I love that part. And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and he commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, Jesus asked the man, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And he said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and he followed him, glorifying God and all the people. And all the people, when they saw, when they saw it, they gave praise to God. I want us to consider this for a moment because when he cries out, have mercy on me, what, what he's asking for is compassion. Jesus, have compassion. That's what Habakkuk is saying. Have compassion on us. Make, make your heart be turned toward us. And compassion is not just an emotion, but compassion is, is always connected to an action. So if there is, so again, if we think about compassion ministries, compassion ministries can't be just feeling a certain way. It's actually got to be doing some things. I'm not really concerned about how a person feels about an issue. I'm concerned about what they're doing about an issue. So for us as, as, as Christians, what we should have is a posture that resembles Jesus where he was, is compassionate about the lost. He's compassionate about those that are around him. But when we, we look at this text, there is this cry for mercy. Now, now see the picture. Jesus at this point in his ministry can't go many places without, like, in secrecy. People know who Jesus is by this time. They know what's going on. They've heard the stories. They've heard the rumblings. Hey, he's a miracle worker. If you're hungry and you ain't got anything to eat, show up in a big crowd and he, can make, he makes magic happen with some bread and some fish. Like the, the stories are being told about Jesus. And Jesus is going through and this blind man is sitting there and he says, hey, what's, what's going on? What meaneth this? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. And I want you to notice here, and I don't want us to miss this. They say to him, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. They refer to Jesus by his government name. They say, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. The way he responds to Jesus is not by his government name. They were, he responds to Jesus by the messianic call, son of David, have mercy on me. In other words, He's not trying to talk to Jesus and about Jesus the way that other people are currently. He's trying to connect to Jesus in a way that is historical. In other words, all the stories that he's heard, he now wants God to produce in his midst. 
And listen to me, this is what I'm praying for, and this is what I'm asking God to do among us, what I'm asking God to do in my life, what I'm asking God to do in our church, is this year, God, make the things that I've heard historical, let them happen. Let the miracles that I've read about, let the things that I've studied, let the stuff I've heard about in the history of the church, let us see that in our midst. My prayer for you, friend, is that you will walk into your workplaces and people will be stopped in their tracks because the presence of God in your life is that strong. You see, listen to me, when I preach and I get this excited, I'm not getting excited about it just happening in my life, but I'm excited about it happening in our collective lives. And then we come back and we share the story. We share the story of the goodness of God. We share the story in the way in which Jesus stops when his people cry out and call him by his name. But there are many of us who have been crying out to Jesus and we've allowed ourselves to be silenced because some other people told us it was uncomfortable for them. And I just want to offer you this. Listen to me. There are going to be some times for you to get from the Lord what you desire. It will require for you to get a little bit uncomfortable. Now let's be real careful here just for a second. My church background, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Pentecostal kid. Some of you, that's easy to see. I'm a Pentecostal kid. I haven't left that behind. I'm, I'm there. I'm still in. But listen to me. Here's what I've experienced. That there are many times we take passages like this and we take moments like this, and here's what we do. We say to the congregation, if you're not doing X, then Jesus won't do Y. And I just want to be really, really clear. If you think that God responds to you, to me, to us, on the basis of how loud our worship is, on how, how demonstrative we cry out, how much we move around and how we de- I just want to, that is the paganism in the Old Testament that Jesus, that, that the Lord condemns throughout the book of Isaiah and other places. So here's what this means. I want us to have exuberant praise, filled with energy, filled with joy, right? I don't think joy looks like, I'm joyful. Let me tell you. <laughs> so joyful. But I, I don't want you to be inauthentic to how and, and who God created you to be. Some of you in this room, when you come into places of worship, you are deeply moved in your soul. And, and it may never come out in the same way that it might come out in my life. And can you, can you hear me say this? As a, this is the beauty of a non-denominational church. We got it all. I love talking to you at the end of the church. Why? Because some of you, there, there's, I'm looking at the room. Okay, they're not here, so I can say this. There's, a, there's a, a beautiful family, and at the end of every Sunday, they go, thank you, Father. And I'm like, sure. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, all right. Cool. All right. I, I, love, I love that. I'm getting a collar. Like, you guys didn't know I'm getting a collar and a robe? Listen to me. I, I, the beautiful thing about what God has here is that many of us have come from different backgrounds church-wise. Some of you, this is... This is like the first church you've ever like come to. I love that. But listen to me, what I'm not going to do is get into this place and allow us to sort of buy into these lies that that God has to do certain things based on if I if I do these things then Jesus has to respond. Like that's not it. The the, the correct reading of the text is this. The man got Jesus's attention. But the real crux of this wasn't his yelling to get Jesus' attention. The crux of this is how he responded when Jesus came near. When Jesus came near, Jesus poses a question, and the question is what? What do you want me to do for you? And his response is faith-filled, and Jesus moves. Now listen to me. There is a rhythm in Scripture. God responds to the faith of his people. The problem is we're really smart at turning biblical narrative into transaction. So what we've done is we've extrapolated this out of the scriptures, and now I'm doing business with God. I'm doing deals with God. Some of us have to be very, very careful. We go into a time of praying and fasting, and you think that God has to move because you're fasting, and that ain't true. Fasting is about moving our hearts more than it is about moving God's hand. If we was in an amen in church, that was it. That was the moment. Some of y'all felt it. Some of y'all, yes, that was it. 
Just because we're not running the aisles don't mean we can't talk back to the preacher. Y'all see what I'm saying? Let's find the middle ground here. For us, there's this, we have, we got to be careful. I missed it, but it's probably real good. <laughs> we're recording this. We got to behave, y'all. We got to behave. Some of us have gotten really, really good because here's the, let's just be honest. You can fake transactions. You can't fake authentic moves of God. And many of us, because we haven't seen authentic moves of God, have stopped telling the story of what God has done among his people. And now we live this sort of fraudulent existence where we're faking like we have this intimacy with God when all we have is a bunch of insufficient fun transactions in our spirituality. We're writing bad checks. So, so here, here let, me, let me root us in the word here for a second. Here's what we have to do. We have to do just what we see the people of God doing in the Old Testament. In the midst of their terrible circumstance, how do they appeal to God? Not on their emotions, not on their feelings, not on their present circumstances. Their hope is attached to what they have seen God do. And listen to this. Their faith is rooted in what God did generations previously. We don't like to wait for God to work a miracle in a week. We cast off restraint if it takes months. Man, we live in a culture and a generation that doesn't understand what it is to tarry. We're looking at our watch and we're like, ah, we gotta get out of church. We gotta get to lunch. Man, lunch will be there. You only come once a month anyways. You might as well be here. Man, don't, man. That's the national average. I ain't picking on y'all. But that's a sad day. When we come to the house of God, we put a stopwatch on him, stamping our foot, and we're mad when all of that is actually the wrong posture anyways, I'm here because of what he's done in the word. If he never does another thing, he saved my soul. He don't gotta do nothing else. Yes, I'm gonna bring it. Yes, I'm gonna ask. But at the end of the day, our God's a deliverer. And he delivers his people in accordance to his plan. Can you imagine being in Egypt for generation upon generation upon generation 400 years. And the Bible says this, that the prayers of his people reached the Lord and he responded. Can I be honest? There's moments where I read the Bible and I was like, what took you so long? Like, what took you so long? The problem is you and I are working on a time frame that is linear. And God sees it all. God understands the purpose that he's working throughout humanity. And he invites us to participate. He invites us to tell the story. And he invites us to have the posture that Habakkuk has. Is Lord, do among us what you did among them. I know that you're not tired. I know that you're not, not weak. I know that you're able. God, work among us. Do among us. Have mercy, God. Move. Once again, do it. Once again, pour your spirit out, God. Once again, raise from the dead. Once again, open blind eyes. Once again, stand among your people and pour out your spirit. This is what I'm asking for for our church. Once again, God. Once again, let us be the people that testify to the goodness of God. Let us be the people that stand and say, this is what God has done. If you're taking notes, I got two points for you today. All that was introduction. Here's the two points I want you to take home with you, all right? First one is simply this. Desperation leads to deliverance. Desperation leads to deliverance. But listen to me, this is more than rescue. We're, we're, we're after more than just God rescuing us from uncomfortable situations. We want to posture our lives with reverence before the Lord. No secondhand glory. Here's what I mean by that. I don't want to tell stories about God moving in somebody else's life. I want to experience the presence of God for myself. Yes, I want to celebrate with you. Yes, I want to, I want to, I want to high five with you and God's moving. But listen to me, I'm not satisfied with you eating the meal and telling me how it tastes. Give me a bite. 
can't stand when people are like, man, I had this meal and it was great. And they keep talking to you about, about invite me over. Let me taste that. That's the same thing I am with the Lord. How, this is how I'm posturing my heart in prayer. God, I want more of you. More of you. More of your sensitivity. More of your grace, God. More of your mercy. Take out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. God, I just want, I just want more of you. And friends, when the Lord is passing us by, we don't sit back. We don't sit back. We call on the Lord to deliver us. We know Jesus by more than his government name. We know him as the Messiah. We know him as the Savior. We know him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's interesting in that, that moment, they're addressing Jesus by where he's from. And the blind man is addressing Jesus by what he's going to do. I want to be postured that way. He is our soon coming king. He is the king of the universe. And he desires to pour out his spirit among his people. The second thing is simply this. Repentance leads to renewal. There's a part of Habakkuk's heart where he has to come to grips with the people currently are not living in, in faithfulness unto God. So when he's asking God to have mercy, because he understands that there is a there is a response when we are unfaithful to God. There is a response that the Lord, the Lord will chastise us, the Lord will redeem us, or the Lord will rebuke us. So there has to be a place where we, where we acknowledge and we recognize. There has to be a place where repentance is not something we do seasonally, but we, we need to be in a posture of repentance like daily. Don't let it be too long for when you kind of go to the Lord and you, you say, oh, I, gotta, I need to lay my sins at the, at the foot of the cross. I'm reminded of the moment where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. You remember that setting? He's washing the disciples' feet. And then Peter, I love Peter. I love Peter so much. Peter comes and what does he say? Like, it's, just, it's just like a cool moment. And Peter's just like super extra. Everybody else is like, it's just weird. Jesus are washing their feet. And this is a moment of like a posture of a servant. And they're not comfortable because they know who Jesus is by this time. And it's real awkward for them. And then Peter says, listen, he says, hey, he said, Jesus, don't stop at my feet. He said, wash my head, wash my hands. He said, just dump the whole bucket on me, Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, Peter, he said, those that have been washed, those that have been bathed, you just need to clean your feet from time to time. You see, many of us in this room, we've had the moment where we've, we've come to, to faith in Jesus. We've had our sins forgiven. And what we forget to do sometimes is live a life in a posture of returning to the foot of the cross and saying, God, somewhere along the line, I've, I've had some drift. You know this in your companies. It's called mission creep. If you don't keep the task and the vision and the mission in front, it creeps. Other people get to hijack it. Other people get to inform it. Other people get to sort of pull it a different... But no, no, we say, God, I, my life has, has drifted. Maybe it's not massive, but maybe it's just enough where it's no longer sort of in that, in that lane that you're called to be in, that you're supposed to be in. You see, repentance is the first step for God to bring renewal, for God to then make whole what was broken. Return life to something that had lost it. There has to come a point where we say, God, I, I need you. I need you. Have your way. 